Hey everyone, welcome back. If you thought we were done with bad cars from the 1950s, think again. Today we've got seven more examples of cars that had all the wrong moves. Whether it was strange designs, poor engineering, or just bad ideas. Let's dive into these head scratchers. The 1950 Nash Air Flight stands as a unique chapter in automotive history, embodying the era's fascination with futuristic design, while also highlighting the risks of straying too far from conventional aesthetics. Introduced during a time when automakers were experimenting with new shapes and technologies, the Air Flight was Nash's bold attempt to reimagine what a car could be. However, its enclosed wheels and bulbous, egg-like shape made it a polarizing figure on the road. Nash marketed the Airflight as the car of the future, emphasizing its advanced aerodynamics and innovative design. The idea was to create a vehicle that cut through the air with minimal resistance, thereby improving fuel efficiency and performance. To achieve this, the Airflight featured fully enclosed wheels, a design choice that was rare for the time. This, coupled with its smooth, rounded body, gave the car an almost aircraft-like appearance a nod to the growing influence of aerodynamics in automotive design. While the Airflight's design was indeed forward-thinking, it was also highly unconventional, which proved to be a double-edged sword. The car's bulbous shape, with its exaggerated curves and lack of sharp lines, made it stand out, though not always in a positive way. Many potential buyers found the design to be too radical, preferring the more traditional and familiar looks of other cars from the era. The enclosed wheels, while innovative, were seen by some as an unnecessary departure from the norm, adding to the car's overall oddness. Inside, the Air Flight continued its theme of unconventional design. The car's interior was spacious and featured a curved dashboard that echoed the exterior's rounded lines. Nash also equipped the Air Flight with advanced features for its time, such as unibody construction, which provided better structural integrity and a unique weather-eye ventilation system. Despite these innovations, the car's unusual exterior design overshadowed its functional benefits. The Airflight's aerodynamic advantages were real, but they were not enough to overcome the public's lukewarm reception to its looks. While the design may have been ahead of its time, it clashed with the aesthetic preferences of the 1950s, a decade known for its fascination with chrome, fins, and more flamboyant styling. The Airflight's smooth, almost featureless body did not align with these trends, making it a tough sell for Nash. In the end, the Nash Airflight became more of an automotive curiosity than a commercial success. Its unique design ensured that it would be remembered, but not necessarily for the reasons Nash had hoped. The car's futuristic look, while innovative, was too unconventional for most buyers, who were not ready to embrace such a radical departure from the traditional car designs of the time. The legacy of the 1950 Nash Air Flight is one of bold experimentation and the risks that come with pushing the boundaries of design. While it may not have been a success in its day, the Air Flight is now appreciated as a symbol of the era's willingness to explore new ideas, even if they didn't always resonate with the public. Its story is a reminder that being different in the automotive world can be both a strength and a weakness, depending on how well that difference aligns with the tastes of the time. The 1951 Willys Aero was an ambitious attempt by Willys Overland Motors to carve out a space in the competitive post-war automotive market. Known primarily for their rugged military Jeeps, Willys ventured into the passenger car market with the Aero, aiming to produce a compact, affordable vehicle that could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bigger, more established brands. However, despite its promise, the Aero failed to deliver on several key fronts, leading to its eventual decline. When it was introduced, the Willys Aero was positioned as a practical and economical choice for post-war American families. The idea was to create a car that was both lightweight and fuel-efficient, characteristics that were particularly appealing in the early 1950s as the country transitioned from wartime austerity to peacetime prosperity. The Aero was compact, making it easier to maneuver and park in crowded urban environments, and it was priced to be accessible to a broad range of consumers. However, the execution of the Aero fell short of its potential. Under the hood, the car was equipped with a modest engine that, while adequate for basic transportation, lacked the power and performance needed to stand out in a market where bigger, faster cars were becoming the norm. 
the Aero's engine struggled to provide the acceleration and speed that drivers were beginning to expect, especially as the American love affair with powerful, stylish cars took hold in the 1950s. The Aero's design, too, was unremarkable. While the car was functional and straightforward, it lacked the flair that could have made it a desirable option. In a decade known for its bold automotive designs, where tail fins, chrome, and vibrant colors dominated the landscape, the Aero's plain utilitarian appearance did little to capture the imagination of consumers. It was practical, yes, but it was also forgettable. And in an era where style was increasingly important, the Aero's conservative design left it at a disadvantage. One of the most significant drawbacks of the Willys Aero was its reliability, or lack thereof. Willys was known for producing durable, reliable vehicles, particularly with their Jeeps, which had earned a reputation for ruggedness and dependability during World War II. However, the Aero failed to live up to this legacy. The car had a reputation for mechanical issues, which further tarnished its image in the eyes of consumers who were looking for dependable transportation. The market response to the Willys Aero reflected these shortcomings. Consumers were beginning to demand more from their cars. More power, more style, and more reliability. The Aero, with its underwhelming engine, bland design, and questionable dependability, simply could not compete with the offerings from larger, more established automakers. As a result, the Aero struggled to gain traction in the market, and sales remained lackluster. Despite its shortcomings, the Willys Aero is remembered today as an example of the challenges faced by smaller automakers in a rapidly evolving industry. The post-war era was a time of significant change in the automotive world, with new technologies, designs, and consumer expectations shaping the market. While the Aero was an earnest attempt to meet these demands, it ultimately fell short, overshadowed by the more powerful, stylish, and reliable cars produced by its competitors. The story of the 1951 Willys Aero serves as a reminder that in the automotive industry, innovation and ambition must be matched by execution and an understanding of market trends. The Aero's failure was not due to a lack of effort or intent, but rather a misalignment with the desires and expectations of the time. It is a case study in how even the best intentions can falter when a product does not fully resonate with its intended audience. The 1953 Dodge Coronet is a prime example of a car that, despite having the potential to make a mark, ended up being overshadowed by its competitors due to a combination of uninspired design and lackluster performance. Positioned as a mid-range offering in Dodge's lineup, the Coronet was meant to strike a balance between affordability and the kind of features that consumers were beginning to expect from their vehicles. However, the execution left much to be desired and the Coronet ultimately struggled to find its footing in a rapidly evolving automotive market. At first glance, the 1953 Dodge Coronet had a few things going for it. It was a large car, reflecting the American automotive trend of bigger being better. The Coronet was intended to offer ample interior space, making it a comfortable option for families and long drives. This focus on size and comfort was in line with the era's growing emphasis on luxury and convenience in the automotive industry. However, this emphasis on size also contributed to one of the Coronet's biggest drawbacks, its bulk. The Coronet was heavy, and its substantial size made it feel cumbersome on the road. This bulkiness was not complemented by the kind of power that might have made the car more enjoyable to drive. Under the hood, the Coronet's engine was adequate, but not exceptional, leaving the car feeling sluggish and underpowered, particularly when compared to the more dynamic offerings from other manufacturers at the time. The design of the 1953 Dodge Coronet was another area where the car failed to stand out. The automotive world of the early 1950s was one of bold experimentation and distinctive styling, with manufacturers pushing the envelope to create cars that captured the imagination of the public. Unfortunately, the Coronet did not follow suit. Its design was conservative, to the point of being bland. The car lacked the eye-catching details or innovative features that could have set it apart from the competition. In an era where style was increasingly important, the Coronet's uninspired appearance made it easy to overlook. This lack of distinction was problematic for Dodge, as the Coronet was supposed to fill a critical role in their lineup. It was intended to appeal to a broad range of consumers, offering a step up from entry-level models without reaching the high prices of luxury vehicles. However, in trying to cater to everyone, the Coronet ended up not appealing strongly to anyone in particular. 
it was too bland to attract buyers looking for style, and its performance was too underwhelming to appeal to those who wanted a bit more excitement behind the wheel. In the competitive automotive landscape of the 1950s, where brands were vying for consumer attention with increasingly innovative and stylish models, the 1953 Dodge Coronet fell short. It was a car that lacked the charisma needed to carve out a niche in a crowded market. The Coronet's failure to excite buyers is reflected in its sales, which were lackluster compared to other models in Dodge's lineup. Consumers were looking for vehicles that offered more than just basic transportation. They wanted cars that were a statement of style, power, or luxury, and the Coronet failed to deliver on these fronts. Despite its shortcomings, the 1953 Dodge Coronet is an interesting footnote in automotive history. It serves as a reminder that even well-established brands can misjudge the market, producing cars that, while functional, fail to capture the spirit of the times. The Coronet's blend of bulk, blandness, and underwhelming performance made it a forgettable entry in Dodge's history, and it stands as an example of how critical design and performance are in creating a car that resonates with buyers. In the end, the Coronet was a car that tried to be many things, but succeeded at none. And its legacy is one of missed opportunities in an era of automotive excitement. The 1954 Buick Special is a quintessential example of a car that played it too safe in a time when the automotive industry was increasingly characterized by bold designs and innovative engineering. Buick, a brand traditionally known for combining luxury with reliable performance, seemed to miss the mark with the Special, opting for a conservative approach that, while dependable, failed to capture the imagination of consumers. This cautious strategy resulted in a vehicle that was solid but uninspiring, especially in an era when car buyers were eager for something more exciting. At its core, the 1954 Buick Special was designed to be a dependable, middle-of-the-road option within the Buick lineup. It was meant to offer a balance between affordability and the brand's signature touches of luxury, catering to a broad audience that valued reliability over flash. The Special came equipped with a 264 cubic inch V8 engine, which was a respectable power plant for the time. It provided adequate performance for everyday driving, ensuring that the car could handle the demands of commuting and family travel without issue. However, in an era when automakers were beginning to offer more powerful and responsive engines, the Special's performance was just that, adequate. It didn't stand out, and it certainly didn't set any new benchmarks in terms of power or speed. One of the most significant criticisms of the 1954 Buick Special was its design. The automotive world in the early 1950s was alive with experimentation, as manufacturers sought to attract attention with distinctive, sometimes even daring designs. However, Buick chose a much more conservative path with the Special. The car's exterior was clean and functional, but it lacked the eye-catching details that were becoming increasingly important in drawing buyers to showrooms. The Special's design was characterized by smooth, unembellished lines a modest grille, and minimal chrome trim. Features that, while not unattractive, were also not particularly memorable. Inside, the 1954 Buick Special continued its theme of conservative design. The interior was comfortable and well-made, with the quality craftsmanship that Buick was known for. But it didn't offer anything beyond the basics. The dashboard was straightforward, with a functional layout that prioritized ease of use over visual flair. For buyers who valued practicality and a no-nonsense approach to driving, this might have been enough. But for those looking for a bit of excitement or luxury, the Special fell short. One of the key challenges for the 1954 Buick Special was the competition it faced. Other automakers were beginning to take risks with their designs, introducing features like wraparound windshields, tail fins, and more powerful engines. These bold choices helped differentiate their vehicles in a crowded market and appealed to a growing segment of consumers who wanted their cars to make a statement. In contrast, the Buick Special's conservative design seemed almost anachronistic, as if it belonged to an earlier era. While it was undoubtedly a reliable and well-constructed vehicle, it didn't offer the kind of innovation that was beginning to define the automotive industry. The 1954 Buick Special's conservative approach also had an impact on its sales. Buick had long been a respected name in the industry, known for producing cars that combined luxury with dependability. However, the Special's lack of excitement made it difficult for Buick to capture the attention of younger buyers or those looking to upgrade to something more modern. As a result, 
the special was often overlooked in favor of more dynamic offerings from other brands, which were seen as more in tune with the desires of the post-war consumer. In hindsight, the 1954 Buick special serves as a reminder that even established brands can sometimes misjudge the market. Buick's decision to play it safe with the special may have been rooted in a desire to maintain its reputation for reliability, but in doing so, the brand missed an opportunity to innovate and evolve. The special's legacy is that of a car that was good, but not great. Dependable, but not exciting. It's a vehicle that did everything it was supposed to do, but nothing more. And in an era of growing consumer expectations, that simply wasn't enough. Today, the 1954 Buick Special is remembered more for what it wasn't than for what it was. A conservative choice in a time when the automotive world was ready for something bold. The 1955 Studebaker President is a classic example of a car that struggled to meet the demands of an evolving automotive landscape. Intended as the flagship model for Studebaker, the President was envisioned as a symbol of the brand's prestige and engineering prowess. However, despite its lofty ambitions, the President quickly became a symbol of missed opportunities and outdated design, emblematic of Studebaker's difficulties in keeping pace with its more dynamic competitors. In the mid-1950s, the American automotive market was undergoing significant changes. Consumers were increasingly drawn to cars that offered not just reliability, but also modern styling, powerful engines, and luxurious features. This was a time when automotive design was becoming bolder and more forward-thinking, with manufacturers experimenting with new technologies and aesthetics to capture the imagination of a post-war populace eager for innovation. Unfortunately, the 1955 Studebaker president seemed to miss this memo, delivering a vehicle that felt more like a holdover from an earlier era than a contender in the rapidly changing market. The president's exterior design was one of its most notable shortcomings. While other manufacturers were pushing the envelope with sleek, futuristic looks, the 1955 president retained a boxy, conservative appearance that failed to excite buyers. The car's styling was rooted in the early 1950s, with a front grille and body lines that seemed dated when compared to the streamlined designs being offered by competitors like General Motors and Ford. The overall impression was one of cautiousness, a car that was designed not to offend, but also not to inspire. This conservative approach extended to the car's performance as well. Despite being marketed as Studebaker's top-of-the-line model, the President did not deliver the kind of power that buyers in the mid-1950s were beginning to expect. While the car was equipped with a V8 engine, it lacked the robust performance that would have set it apart as a true luxury vehicle. In an era when horsepower was becoming an increasingly important selling point, the President's underwhelming engine performance made it difficult to justify its place as a flagship model. Inside, the 1955 Studebaker President continued to disappoint. While it was certainly well-built and comfortable, the interior design lacked the luxury touches that were becoming standard in other high-end models. The dashboard and controls were functional but uninspired and the overall layout failed to convey the sense of opulence that Studebaker needed to compete in the luxury market. For a car named the President, it lacked the commanding presence that such a title implied. One of the biggest challenges the President faced was its competition. By 1955, the big three automakers, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, were dominating the market with vehicles that combined modern design, powerful engines, and innovative features. Against this backdrop, the Studebaker president seemed out of step with the times. It was a car that might have been successful a few years earlier, but by 1955, it was clear that Studebaker had not kept up with the rapid pace of change in the industry. The disappointing sales of the 1955 Studebaker president were a reflection of its inability to connect with consumers. Despite Studebaker's efforts to position the president as a premium offering, the car's outdated design and lackluster performance meant that it struggled to compete with more modern, dynamic vehicles. Buyers were looking for cars that offered both style and substance, and the President, unfortunately, provided neither in sufficient measure. In the broader context of Studebaker's history, the President's failure was symptomatic of the challenges the company was facing during this period. Once a major player in the American automotive industry, 
Studebaker was increasingly struggling to maintain its market share in the face of intense competition. The president's inability to capture the attention of buyers was indicative of a larger issue, Studebaker's difficulty in adapting to the new realities of the post-war automotive market. The legacy of the 1955 Studebaker president is one of missed potential. It was a car that could have helped to reinvigorate the Studebaker brand, but instead, it became another chapter in the company's slow decline. The president's outdated styling, mediocre performance, and lack of luxury features made it a car that was easy to overlook, even at a time when Studebaker desperately needed a hit. Today, the 1955 president serves as a reminder of the importance of innovation and the dangers of complacency in an industry that never stops evolving. The 1956 Packard executive is often cited as a car that illustrates the perils of trying to straddle two markets without fully committing to either. Positioned as a mid-tier offering that aimed to provide Packard's hallmark luxury at a more accessible price, the executive was intended to attract a broader range of buyers during a time when Packard was desperately trying to reclaim its former glory. Unfortunately, the car's attempt to balance luxury with affordability resulted in a vehicle that satisfied neither high-end nor budget-conscious consumers, ultimately contributing to Packard's downward spiral. The mid-1950s were a challenging time for Packard. Once a dominant force in the American luxury car market, the brand had seen its fortunes decline after World War II. The post-war era brought increased competition, particularly from Cadillac and Lincoln, and Packard struggled to keep pace. The executive was introduced as a last-ditch effort to regain market share by offering a car that combined the prestige of the Packard name with a price tag that was more competitive with mainstream brands. However, this strategy backfired in several key ways. One of the executive's most significant shortcomings was its positioning within the Packard lineup. By trying to appeal to both luxury buyers and more budget-conscious consumers, the executive ended up in a no-man's land. It was more expensive than entry-level cars from other manufacturers, yet it didn't offer the same level of opulence as Packard's higher-end models. This left potential buyers confused about who the executive was really for. Those looking for a true luxury experience were likely to opt for one of Packard's more established upscale models, while those seeking affordability could find better value elsewhere. The executive's design also reflected its confused identity. While it featured some of the upscale styling cues associated with the Packard brand, such as a distinctive grille and tasteful chrome accents, it lacked the grandeur and presence of the company's flagship vehicles. The car's exterior was attractive, but conservative and it didn't make the bold statement that luxury buyers often sought. Inside, the executive offered a comfortable ride with decent materials, but it fell short of the lavish interiors that Packard was known for. The overall effect was that of a car that was trying to be luxurious without fully committing to the experience. Performance-wise, the executive was competent but unremarkable. It was powered by a V8 engine that provided adequate power but it didn't offer the kind of thrilling driving experience that might have helped it stand out in a crowded market. The car handled well enough for a vehicle of its size, but again, there was nothing about the executive's performance that set it apart from the competition. For a car that was supposed to represent the best of both worlds, it delivered an experience that was ultimately middling. The executive's failure to capture the imagination of buyers had broader implications for Packard. By 1956, the company was already in serious trouble, and the executive's lackluster reception did nothing to improve its fortunes. Instead of revitalizing the brand, the executive became another example of Packard's inability to adapt to the changing automotive landscape. The car's ambiguous positioning, uninspired design, and mediocre performance were symptomatic of a company that had lost its way. Packard's decision to market the executive as a mid-tier luxury vehicle also had the unintended consequence of diluting the brand's image. For decades, Packard had been synonymous with automotive excellence, producing some of the most prestigious and desirable cars in the world. The introduction of a budget Packard, even one that was still relatively expensive by mainstream standards, undermined this reputation. It sent a message that Packard was no longer confident in its ability to compete at the highest levels of the market, and this perception further eroded the brand's appeal. In hindsight, the 1956 Packard executive can be seen as a symbol of the company's decline. It was a car that was supposed to represent a new direction for Packard, but instead, it highlighted the brand's inability to adapt to the changing times. 
by trying to appeal to too many different types of buyers, the executive ended up pleasing none of them, and it failed to provide the boost that Packard so desperately needed. Today, the executive is remembered as a well-intentioned, but ultimately misguided attempt to save a company that was already on the brink of collapse. The story of the 1956 Packard executive is a cautionary tale for any automaker. It demonstrates the risks of trying to be all things to all people, and the importance of maintaining a clear and consistent brand identity. The 1957 DeSoto Firedome is often remembered as a car that epitomized the excesses of 1950s automotive design. During this era, tail fins became a defining feature of American cars, symbolizing the futuristic, rocket-inspired designs that captivated the public's imagination. However, the Firedome took this trend to the extreme, with fins so exaggerated that they almost seemed to parody the very idea of sleek, aerodynamic styling. While the car certainly made a bold statement, it also divided opinions, with some viewing it as an over-the-top embodiment of the era's most flamboyant design impulses. The DeSoto Firedome was part of the larger DeSoto lineup, which was Chrysler's mid-range brand positioned between Dodge and Chrysler in terms of luxury and price. The Firedome itself was marketed as a more affordable option within the DeSoto range, but its styling suggested anything but restraint. The car's massive tail fins were its most distinctive feature, towering over the rear end and giving the vehicle a look that was both futuristic and slightly absurd. These fins, along with a host of other exaggerated design elements, such as chrome accents and bold two-tone paint schemes, made the Firedome a car that demanded attention. However, this attention was not always positive. While the 1950s were a time when many Americans were fascinated by the idea of the future, think space exploration, jet travel, and atomic energy, the Firedome's design was so extreme that it alienated as many people as it attracted. For every driver who admired its audacity, there was another who found it gaudy and excessive. The car's styling was a prime example of the bigger is better philosophy that dominated the American auto industry at the time, but in the case of the Firedome, bigger often just meant more outlandish. Despite its polarizing appearance, the 1957 DeSoto Firedome was not without its merits. The car was powered by a robust V8 engine, which delivered solid performance for the era. It also offered a comfortable ride, thanks to its well-appointed interior and smooth suspension. For those who could get past the exterior, the Firedome provided a driving experience that was on par with other mid-range American cars of the time. However, the car's outlandish design often overshadowed these qualities, making it hard for many buyers to take it seriously. One of the Firedome's biggest challenges was that it arrived at a time when the American public's tastes were beginning to shift. The late 1950s saw the beginning of a move away from the excessive styling that had defined the earlier part of the decade. As economic conditions tightened and consumer preferences began to favor more practical and understated designs, cars like the Firedome, with their exaggerated fins and flashy details, quickly fell out of favor. What had once been seen as futuristic and exciting began to be viewed as tacky and outdated. The Firedome's rapid decline in popularity was emblematic of the broader struggles facing DeSoto as a brand. By the late 1950s, DeSoto was already facing stiff competition from both within and outside of the Chrysler Corporation. The brand's identity had become increasingly muddled as it struggled to distinguish itself from other Chrysler offerings. The Firedome, with its extreme styling, was a gamble to recapture the public's attention but it ended up being a misstep that did little to halt DeSoto's decline. As styles changed and the market for flashy finned cars dwindled, the Firedome quickly became a relic of a bygone era. It was discontinued shortly after its release, as DeSoto shifted focus in an attempt to align with the new, more conservative tastes of the late 1950s and early 1960s. Unfortunately, this shift came too late to save the brand and DeSoto would eventually be phased out altogether by Chrysler in 1961. Today, the 1957 DeSoto Firedome is a fascinating artifact of 1950s automotive history. It represents both the peak and the excess of the tailfin craze, a car that pushed the boundaries of design to their absolute limit. While it may not have been a commercial success, it remains a memorable example of a time when American cars were as much about style and spectacle as they were about transportation. The Firedome's dramatic appearance, 
combined with its association with the decline of the DeSoto brand, has cemented its place in the annals of automotive history as one of the most distinctive and divisive cars of its time. And there you have it, seven more of the dumbest and worst cars from America in the 1950s. These cars might have had big ambitions, but they just didn't deliver. Which one do you think was the biggest flop? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.